Hi, I'm Jim. Welcome back to my lab here at Lawrence Tech. Uh, today's video, we're going to talk about uh, DC motors, controlling DC motors using microcontrollers like the Arduino and uh, some of the circuitry we have to use to actually power the motor because an Arduino or similar device microcontroller uh, typically won't source enough current for a motor. Uh, these are just relatively cheap motors. I think I got them from SparkFun. But uh, come on in and we'll have some fun. So right now I've just got the motor directly, or it was, directly connected to the power supply. And we'll look at what happens as I change the voltage and the load on the motor. Um, this is the voltage. That's the current that it's drawing. Initially there's not going to be much current. It won't show up. As I turn the voltage up slowly, a couple tenths, four tenths, somewhere around, it takes about half a volt to get it to move at all. But if I put, you know, put my finger on it, it just stops. There's a volt. Now I'm starting to make some torque to overcome the friction. I'll let go for a second. Now I'll run it up to, let's say, about seven volts. Hope my finger's not in the way. So just running free, it's running pretty fast and the current is too low to register. When I put a load on the motor and start slowing it down, you can see the current going up. And if I bring it all the way to a halt, I got a stall current of about one amp. You don't want to stall it too long. So the amount of current that the motor draws is going to vary with the load you put on it and how much you slow it down. Okay? So that's just the basic characteristic of these uh, permanent magnet DC motors. Uh, okay, before I start actually hooking it up, I thought I'd draw a picture of what I'm hooking up on the board here because it's a lot easier to see here than in that tangle of wires on the breadboard. So this is our motor. This is our positive power from the power supply. I'm going to set that about 7 volts. Um, the motor goes to the collector of an NPN transistor. We'll assume it's a TIP-102. This is a Darlington transistor developed by Darlington, big surprise, uh, in the late 50s. And really, instead of a simple transistor like I have drawn here, it's actually a cascaded, there's two transistors in the same package, so the gain's a lot higher. Um, but we'll just draw it this way for simplicity. And then the emitter of the transistor goes to ground, okay? The base of the transistor is coming through the resistor to our microcontroller. The microcontroller is giving us a 0 to 5 volt output because it's supplied with 5 volts and also connected to that same ground. That's um, important. We have to have a common ground between our circuitry over here and our microcontroller. We can have different power voltages, and we typically do, but the grounds have to be common. So the way this works, when I put 5 volts here, I start a current flowing through here from the base to the emitter, okay? And a small current here results in a very large current going from the collector to the emitter, okay? So that's basically how a bipolar junction transistor works. And because it's a Darlington, you know, the ratio of these two currents is high, on the order of a thousand perhaps, um, at least hundreds, you know. Um, so what we want, so what we can do is take a low current capacity output, like digital output on a microcontroller, and with this transistor we're controlling a lot of current through the motor, okay? Um, now we have this resistor here. And what that does is limit the current going from the base to the emitter, okay? And so we can figure out what do we need for a resistor here, uh, knowing this voltage, knowing the voltage drop from base to emitter from the data sheet, and knowing the amount of current I need to saturate or fully turn on this transistor to make it operate like a switch. So in this case, um, for the TIP-102, we have about 1.2 volts from the base to the emitter, okay? Um, this is five volts from my microcontroller, so 
5 minus 1.2 gives us um, 3.8 volts. And I know that the current to saturate this is about 4 milliamps or 0.004 amps. And I can apply Ohm's law, uh, rearranging it slightly. The resistance equals the uh, voltage over the current. And if I put uh, voltage is 3.8, my current is 0.004, I get R equal to 950 and close enough to 1K, okay? And I should also mention that I have an oscilloscope connected between here and ground so that we can see the voltage across this motor and switch as we turn it on and off in response to the microcontroller. Okay, so here's the setup. I've got the power supply set to 7 volts. I've got the scope hooked up, like I said. Over here, you probably can't read this, but um, I can tell you what the numbers are. Right now, it's about a 5% duty cycle output, and I've got a little potentiometer here with this uh, that I can turn to change the, change the resistance here, which changes the value of the analog input there, which changes my duty cycle output. Um, and this is, this program, I'm not uploading any of these programs to the web for you guys to use because we're doing this as a class exercise and I need the students to do it, but with this simple control it's just based on the analog input, analog output uh, sample program that comes with the Arduino, a couple minor tweaks. So, um, so right now we're running about a 5% duty cycle and, oops, and my wire just fell off. not the most reliable connection. Um, so a 5% duty cycle, and as you can see, the motor is not turning at all, even though you know this LED is connected in parallel with the motor, just for illustration, and you can see there is a little bit of current going. A little. So as I turn this up, you can see the pulse width changing, and now I'm at 19% duty cycle, with just a little bit of drag on the wheel stops it, and now we're at 27%, and now it's turning fairly, fairly reliably, okay? Um, and this is important to figure out for your application what kind of duty cycles you need to get it moving. There at 21, it's not moving at all. Um, because if you're just trying to control something and control the speed, and you give it, you know, a duty cycle 20, 18, somewhere in here, uh, actually we're at 22 at the moment, 25, depends on how much pressure I put, um, you're not going to get any motion and your control algorithm isn't going to work. So basically, you know, you have to figure out what the minimum duty cycle is to reliably turn this motor, okay? So there's 32. So I wouldn't want to try and use a duty cycle less than 32. If I crank it all the way up here, I can go to 100% and now it's turn along pretty good, okay? But by controlling that duty cycle, I can control the speed, okay? Now if I need accurate speed control, you know, obviously I'm not getting it because, because my wire fell off, because the actual speed depends on the load I'm applying. Uh, it's not very linear because it goes, the speed goes to zero, you know, even though I'm got some duty cycle applied to it. Um, so for ideal speed control or best speed control, we'd want a, some kind of position encoder on the motor or on the wheel, but that'll be a topic for another video. Now, what I've got here, I can control the speed of the motor, obviously, but what I can't do is control the direction. It only runs forward, okay? So what do we do if we want to run a motor backwards? Well, the answer is an H-bridge. Uh, we'll go back over the white board, I'll draw that, and then we'll talk about hooking that one up using a commercially available L298N.
So let's first talk about an H bridge and what it does and why we use it for when we want to control a DC motor in both directions. Okay, this this is our motor. Let me switch colors. So this this is our motor. This is not part of the bridge circuit itself. It's what we're trying to control, and the stuff around the outside is our bridge circuit. We have a voltage supply here. Let's say it's seven volts, okay? And we have a ground down here, and we have these four switches. Now, suppose I were to close this switch and this switch, okay? What would happen? Well, I've got power here. It's going to flow. It's going to go through the motor, down there, and to ground. So I'm going to create a current flow through the motor in this direction and the motor is going to turn in response to that, okay? Now suppose instead I close these two switches, that one and that one, okay? Now I've got power, it's going to flow through the switch, it's going to flow through the motor in the opposite direction here and to ground, okay? So now I'm going to run the motor but in the opposite direction because the motor is essentially hooked up from a current or voltage perspective, it's hooked up two different ways. So depending on which pair of switches I close, I can control the direction of the motor, okay? And by opening and closing these switches rapidly, I can control the duty cycle and the speed, okay? That's the basic concept. A uh, couple things to think about here. What happens what happens if I close this switch and this switch at the same time, right? Um, current straight through the switches, straight to ground. I've just shorted out my power supply in, you know, these are going to be semiconductors in our real H bridge. Uh, you're going to let the smoke out, okay? That's a bad thing. Um, another function you can do, suppose I close these two switches at the same time, okay? Now I've created a loop, essentially, okay? Uh, if the motor is spinning, one characteristic of a DC motor, permanent magnet DC motor, is if you're spinning the armature and you're spinning that conductor inside the, the magnetic field from the magnets, you're generating a current, right? That's how generators work. So you're going to generate a current and it's just going to flow around this loop and you're using up the power from that motor so that by closing these two and leaving these two open, or closing these two and leaving those two open, we essentially make a break. The motor stops a lot faster than if you just leave it freewheeling. And finally, suppose I close these two, I've got current flowing through the motor, okay? And now I open this, what happens, okay? Well, the motor is still spinning, it's going to try and generate a current, but that current has got nowhere to go, right? There's no closed circuit anywhere, and you're, what happens is uh, infinite resistance, some positive current, uh, you get a real high voltage spike. It's not a big deal with those little motors I'm playing with at the moment, but as we get into higher current devices and more power, um, that voltage from the back EMF uh, when you open one of these switches, or both of them, gets real high and is potentially damaging, so we need a way to, to fix that. So the last thing I'm going to touch on is what's typically done in one of these circuits is there will be a diode, a set of diodes, like that, okay? So now if I you know, had this switch closed, my current's flowing, that's closed, okay? Then I open my switch, well, the current can flow essentially back to the voltage source and all the way around to our ground and up through here. So now we have a path for the current to go back into our original voltage source and we don't get that high voltage spike, which is potentially damaging, okay? Um, a lot of bridges will have these diodes built in. That's a good thing. 
Um, the L298N doesn't, and I usually, when we build these, I usually have the students put diodes around it on the circuit board. We're not going to do that for the demonstration today because the currents involved in this little dinky winky motor are just not that high and we're not going to have to worry about it, okay? So let me put the block diagram up and I'll show you a little bit more about what's actually in the L298N and we'll talk about how to hook it up because uh, students have a lot of problem with that, particularly some of the grounds and power supplies. So this is the block diagram from the data sheet, and what this has is two complete H bridge, like I had you know, drawn on the board before, um, A and B, okay? And instead of the switches, you see they have the transistor symbols here, okay? So, these, so if we turn these two transistors on, we run current to our motor, output one, output two, and if we turn those two on, we run power to the motor in the opposite direction, okay? So output one, output two are the connections directly to the motor, okay? And, um, well, let's walk down all the connections here. So VS is the power for the motor, up to 48 volts. Uh, we're going to be using seven volts and that's the power at the top of my bridge, okay? And it goes to both the bridges, okay? Um, the SS is our logic power to control all of these transistors and logic devices. That's typically our plus five volts. There's also a logic ground, or a, a ground in general, okay? Um, that goes to ground, and that ground goes to the ground of your microcontroller and to the ground of the power supply for the motor. Um, input one, input two, these are set up so if I turn on input one, I will turn on, um, I will turn this one on and this one on, okay? And if I turn on input two, I turn those two on, okay? And they're cross-connected in here to make sure that I can't turn them do turn, um, you know, turn both of these on at the same time. If I turn both of these on at the same time, I just get these two on and these two off because of that knot. So it's protected against, you know, really stupid things. Um, so those are the inputs, one, input two. So depending on which one you turn on, the motor will go in forward or reverse. Um, then there's this enable pin, which goes to both the um, both of the sides, okay? And when enable is turned on, you can, the motor runs. When enable is turned off, the motor's off. So what you'll do is you will set either input one or input two high to ch pick your direction, and then you can use the enable as your duty cycle, turning it on and off to control the speed, okay? Um, output one, output two, we talked about those go to the motor. And this down here is one that, for some reason, students like to overlook. Um, there is a sense resistor here, which is optional. I don't normally use it, and that goes to ground. So normally, I just connect this sense output to ground, and this is the ground for the power supply and the ground for the motor. So this comes off the bottom of the bridge, right? So normal operation, the power comes in from VS, goes down the bridge, we'll say it goes down this leg, goes to output two through the motor, back into the bridge here, down this side, and out this sense output to ground, okay? Now like I said, this resistor, if you want to measure the current, okay, you put you know, like a one or two ohm resistor here, you measure the voltage across that resistor, you can tell how much current there is. Uh, normally it's not that important for the kind of things we're doing in class, so I just hook this directly to ground. They show some capacitors here. Those are a good idea. You can usually get away without them. If, you know, if you're doing a commercial application, then you would want to do that to make sure it doesn't glitch. For a little line follower on the table, it's not so much of a big deal. Um, students typically forget, you know, they'll forget to hook up this five volt supply. They'll forget to hook this to ground, things like that. Um, and then, of course, this is the other half of this chip, the other bridge. 
and that's input three and four in the enable beam, okay, and the sense beam. So those all have to be hooked up if you want to control two motors, okay? So let's go to our microcontroller and see how it works. Okay, so I've got this hooked up, and let me walk through the pin assignments here. So this first pin is output 2, that goes to the motor. I have VS, that's my voltage going up to my power supply. And it's just plugged in directly with this red jumper. I have the enable A going to a PWM pin on the Arduino. I have ground going to ground. The current sense A, or essentially the ground end of the H bridge, goes to ground. I didn't put a resistor in it. Output 2 goes to the motor. The input 1, input 2 go to digital outputs on my Arduino, so I can select between forward and reverse. And I will control which one is high with this button here. And you can also see on the Arduino, I have this uh, LED connected so when I push the button it's on, when I let go it's off and that controls you know, which of these two pins digital outputs go high and low. So either one or two will be enabled at any time depending on the state of that switch. This is the logic voltage okay, which goes to my 5 volts on my Arduino. All of the grounds on this, on this rail go to the ground of the Arduino and to the ground of my power supply. This rail here is my 5 volt logic supply from the Arduino. It goes to the chip, it goes to the switch, it goes to the potentiometer which I just have set for low duty cycle. So let's see how this works. Okay, and I'll turn on my power. So you should be able to see the when I play with this button, you can see as I change directions in terms of enable A, enable B, the motor changes directions. If I change the duty cycle here, I've got that off camera. I can control the speed. So I have that use that same output that I used before to control the speed. The only difference now is because I have this H bridge set up, I can control direction and speed. Okay. Okay. And if I had a second motor, I would connect it to all of these. You know, uh, use the enable B inputs three and four, output three and four. Okay. And I can control two motors and which in our line following robot, that's what we're going to do, we'll have one motor connected to this half of the LN298, or L298N, excuse me, and we'll have the other motor connected to this half, so we'll have two duty cycle outputs, two sets of directions. Okay, one last thing I forgot to record, so let me do that now and insert this. When you get your line following platform wired up and the H-bridge wired up and connected to the motors. You want one more piece of test software that you should write. Um, no external inputs, you know, no buttons, no potentiometers, nothing like that. Just strictly a open loop program, you know, command both motors to go forward slowly, stop one, and command one of them to go backwards, stop that, command the other one to go backwards, and then command them both to go forward at a 100% you know, duty cycle instead of 50 and then just repeat that loop and then when you get everything wired up run that program and it should run you know the motor should behave predictably right you should have both same direction one of them backwards the other one backwards and then both fast and that lets you know that you wired up your H bridge correctly it lets you know that the motors are working that you didn't get right and left mixed up, that you didn't get forward and back mixed up, because it's not unusual, you know, to hook them both up and then you get, you know, one motor going this way, well, way, well can I do this? I can't do that. <laughs> you got one motor going this way and the other motor going that way when you're trying to command them in the same direction. Um, that stuff happens, you know, and a very, very, very simple program that just does nothing but turn the motors is a good way to debug that and make sure your hardware is right. Okay? I 
think that's all I need to cover. Uh, we talked about controlling a motor, just the transistor. We talked about hooking this up. Uh, in terms of making a, a bridge circuit, that's for another time, okay? So at this point in this series, we know how to read analog inputs. We know how to control the speeds of the motors. We know how to read all of those uh, sensors. So we should be able to come up with an algorithm to determine the position of the robot relative to the line. And I think that's what I'll talk about next. Thanks for watching and catch you on the flip side.